that infrastructure wasn't put in place. The Lightning Network's not ready yet. The Bitcoin fees are still high. The network still gets congested. And the other you know, competing cryptocurrencies to that don't have a big enough network effect. I feel like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin specifically could have been ready. This could have been the all time you know, moment for it to shine. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Rice Crypto Show, and I'm your host, Rice. And on today's episode, I am joined by Roger Veer. We decided to have a fireside chat and talk about what's happening all around the world these past couple of weeks, and that includes the financial crisis that we are experiencing and what's happening with this virus. Now, before we get into it, with all that being said, I do hope that everybody is staying as safe and as healthy as possible. If this is your first time ever watching any of my videos, I do encourage you to explore my channel. Make sure you're subscribed, smash that like button, hit the notification bell so you can stay up to date with my videos as they come out. And I do encourage you to follow me on Library where I post exclusive content. And I'm going to have links down below so you can follow me on Library. Now we're just going to go ahead and get right into today's video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today I am joined by Roger Veer, and so we decided we wanted to talk about what was going on around the world today. We've got a lot of interesting situations happening with this virus, with a potential economic meltdown, and I reached out to Roger and asked him if he wanted to have kind of a fireside chat and talk about what's going on. So, Roger, thanks for accepting my invitation. How are you doing today? Yeah, my, my pleasure. Uh, feeling a little bit cooped up, having been in the house for a week, but... Uh... But that's life. Better than being sick, I guess. Yeah, no, it's it's some crazy, crazy stuff that we're going through. And um, I mean, before we actually decided to start the interview, I mean, I was talking to you a little bit about some of my thoughts and feelings, and you were like, "Well, why aren't we talking about this during the discussion?" So, um, I'm really concerned with what's going on. I, I mean, we could talk about the virus, and I think the timing of the virus is definitely really odd. Um, I'm trying not to be a conspiracy theorist here. It's just, I study economics, you study economics. Um, since 2008, it, it appeared that our financial system had basically crashed. We put it on live support. Everything was basically zombies. Towards um, last year, we saw um, the inverted yield curve, which every single time this has taken place, it's signaled a recession. And that was the middle of last year towards um, the end of summer, beginning of fall, I believe. And then we started seeing the repo market operations where the overnight night lending uh, between banks was diminishing and the Federal Reserve had to step in with their capital injections, which they called not quantitative easing. And then all of a sudden we have this virus, this pandemic, and now the, the virus is being used as a scapegoat for trying to save our economic system, acting like that everything that's taking place is because of the virus but you and me, we both know differently. So I'd like to get your thoughts on the situation, man. Yeah, and there's a lot happening and you bundled a lot in there. I guess one thing that I find frustrating is most people seem to know, and they go to the DMV and you can see the government does a bad job at handling things and isn't responsible and doesn't, isn't responsible to the customers and all in all is an inefficient organization for getting things done. Yet suddenly now that there's some virus, everybody thinks the government's super competent and it should be able to do everything to everyone and control everything. When, when there's not an emergency, it does a horrible job. Why do you think that they're going to do a good job when there is an emergency? Uh, I, I think that that's really a short-sighted thing to do. So, uh, so I find that frustrating. Well, I mean, do you believe that our system was, was in the position to have this meltdown prior to the coronavirus and regardless of it, the virus came out, we would still be in the same position financially that we are in right now that they're blaming the virus as the cause for. Yeah, I, I think the, the bubble was being inflated already and the, and the virus was just the thing that kind of uh, popped the, the bubble that was already there and had been expanding for years and years and years with all this money printing and easy credit. And I think a lot of people are, are still confused. Like we see, oh, the government's going to print, you know, trillions of dollars and hand it out to people like 
dollars aren't wealth, right? The, the things that are wealth are, you know, actual boxes of Kleenex or face masks or, or cell phones or cars or food that people can eat. It's not the pieces of paper. It's the actual things that people use, right? The capital goods and the consumer goods themselves, not the pieces of, of paper that, that people use to buy and sell those things. So if printing money could make the world a richer place, why is anybody poor, right? You could print, print as much money to make more wealth for everybody all the time, recession or not. Uh, but the truth of the matter is, is that the printing of money doesn't help at all. We need more people in the factories and in the businesses, building the cars, growing the food, building the houses, you know, doctors working to treat people. We need people actually producing the actual goods in the economy that people are consuming and using and then the capital goods to produce more consumer goods, not a bunch of, you know, printing presses, printing money like crazy to give out to their friends. And, uh, if printing money could make people richer, why is anybody ever poor ever? We could just print money for everybody. And that would be, nobody would ever have to work ever again. But the truth of the matter is, is that uh, printing money doesn't make the world a, a richer place at all. It only enriches the people that get that money first. No, nah, yeah, and you said it very well. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunate that for some reason they think that continuing to print more money and put more digits on the balance sheet is going to somehow help this entire situation because it, it seemed like um, everything that was being done, if if I, because it's been so much going on in the past two weeks, it's been so much information overload. Some of my days are even blending a little bit. I think it was Friday. The markets, uh, at, towards the end of the markets closing, the traditional financial markets, um, everything was looking downward because of it. It seemed like all the stimulus that they were going to be introducing wasn't really going to do much of an impact at all because with what they were doing in the repo markets with capital injections, it seemed like that the federal reserve was going up and just basically purchasing a lot of stocks and bonds and just inflating the stock markets, which is why we saw all time highs in the stock markets in February. And now we're back here. They have this stimulus bill that they've introduced that it's, it's an actuality in the U S it's a $6 trillion stimulus bill, but the, Mainstream media only talks about two trillion, which I find interesting. You know, they don't talk about the other four trillion that's supposed to be designated to the Federal Reserve. Um, I found out today that the Fed announced that they are going to be doing temporary lending operations to foreign central banks, and yeah, um, lending to foreign central banks. Okay. Foreign central banks, yes. And that's the, the interesting thing about that was the repo market capital injections was supposed to be a temporary thing too. And as we see, we're still doing it. So um, it, it ultimately kind of feels like the federal reserve, like the, the, the whole entire plan of what central banking was created and designed for. It seems like the federal reserve are at a point in history where they're actually going to be able to become the buyer and lender of last resort. And if, you know, if we don't do something to stop it, and essentially, you know, I'm almost speechless for where this is taking us, but. I think it was Milton Friedman that said that nothing's as permanent uh, as a temporary government program. And I think that's what we're seeing with the, the inflating and the money printing and the, and the bailouts is that uh, they say, oh, this is just a one-time thing. But then sure enough, they do it over and over and over again. And the numbers get bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh that's the only tool they have. You know, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's what it is for the central banks. The only tool they have is money printing. So they think that the solution to everything is printing more money. But in reality, that's causing the problem. The money is just the, the accounting stick that we use to measure the, all the goods and services that are out there in the economy. And if you constantly are changing the, you know, the amount of ticks on the ruler, it makes it really, really hard to, to measure anything and, and do anything accurately. And that's basically what's uh, going on here with this you know, wild money printing from the the central banks and it causes a problem for uh, the entire world's economy and it's less efficient as a result of it and less efficient is just a, a nice way of saying that the entire world is poorer than it otherwise would have been if they hadn't started meddling with the money supply like this. Insane, completely insane. And, and you, uh, I've been you know catching some of your content. You, you spend a lot of time in Japan and you talk about, is it's the yen, right? Yep. Okay, so the what, what was the thing you were talking about with um, the silver... Yeah, I, I don't have any here with me, but I guess the closest things that I have. So this is a micro SD card in my hands. The one yen Japanese coin is only a little bit bigger than one of, one of these. And I don't know what it is. It's like, it's like probably plastic coated with like 
spray painted like silver color or something. It's like a really chintzy looking. Like if you think a penny feels cheap and not worth like anything, the one yen coin feels significantly cheaper than a penny. And so what was really interesting though, is that before World War II, they also had one yen coins, but the one yen coins, and for those in America that are you know, old enough to remember, or that maybe your parents had some silver dollars, like the silver dollars are a pretty hefty coin, and it's, you know, it's big and it weighs one ounce, and if you were to throw a silver dollar at somebody, it would kind of hurt, right? It's a big, mm -hmm. hefty, hefty coin there. The one yen coins used to also be one ounce of silver, which means that the Japanese yen, one yen used to equal one dollar, right? Whereas currently the exchange rate is like 110 yen per dollar. So each yen is worth a little bit less than a penny. But what that means is the Japanese government inflated the currency even more than the U.S. government inflated the currency. And a silver dollar today is worth, what, like 15 or 20 bucks or something like that. Uh, a silver one yen coin from before World War II is now worth something like uh, you know, 2,000 yen. So if That's you think the, the U.S. dollar is bad because it went down, you know, 15 or 20 times, the Japanese yen went down 2,000 times since the war. But it, uh, it's really a, an amazing example. And so you had a bunch of people that during the war were saving these one yen paper notes, like a $1 bill. And then you had other people that saved the one yen silver coin. At the end of the war, the people that saved the silver coin actually still had some value left at the end of the war, whereas the people that were saving the pieces of paper they had nothing. And so I, I think that that's a, a lesson to be learned here with the massive, massive money printing that's going on in the American market now. Like cash, long term, the value is guaranteed to go down over the long term. And so you want to hold your assets in something that's much more, uh, has some other use case other than just being the medium of exchange. And I, and I wanted to bring the situation up with the, in Japan and the yen as a, as a form of inflation that took place in a country and then use uh, as another example, like what's happening in Venezuela or what's happened in Zimbabwe with hyperinflation. Um, do you, I obviously see what's, what's taking place or what has taken place in Japan with the yen, I see it taking place with the dollar. But with all your studying of economics and things like that, do you, do you see us going into a potentiality of hyperinflation with the US dollar? depends on how much money they print and it depends on how quickly people lose trust in those dollars. So I think you and I are about the same age. Uh, so within our lifetime, one Zimbabwe dollar that everybody loves to make fun of and they have these, you know, hundred trillion zillion dollar Zimbabwe notes that you can buy on eBay for, you know, a dollar or two. Um, within our lifetime, as recently as 1983, uh, one Zimbabwe dollar was worth more than one US dollar. So uh, that's pretty wild. Like now you can get these hundred trillion dollars Zimbabwe notes. Remember one single US dollar was worth less than one Zimbabwe dollar uh, as recently as 1983. And so don't think the same thing can't happen to the US dollar. Oh, yeah, no, it's not you, guaranteed you, you, that it's going to happen, but it's a real possibility and people should prepare for that. There is actual early editions of monopoly money that has more value than US dollars because they're collectors. I but wasn't aware of that, but I, I believe it. So it's, I, you know, even you think, from the time I was a kid till now, like the price of soda pop and or like smoothies from the shopping mall, uh, it's amazing just how much more expensive everything's gotten just within my my own lifetime. And for anybody that's you know more than thirty, or, or you can probably you know think back, what was the price of a can of soda from the vending machine when you were a kid, and what is it now? It's totally different. So. But the sad thing about that, Roger, is people don't think that it's because the dollar loses value. They think it's because whomever is making that product is charging more. They're being greedy. They want more money for their product. And, and, you know, people, it's just because of the way that we've been conditioned. And, um, you know, when I first read about you, is it safe to call you an expatriate? Since you, I you guess, mean, can you define what expatriate means? Well, like I mean, like to just somewhat, part. some, you used to be a U.S. citizen. You're no longer technically a U.S. citizen, right? Right. You know, right. um, I, I used to look at that kind of like, you know, I, I used to feel kind of weird about that. But as I have educated myself more, um, I really would like to be able to distance myself from what has, um, what our country has become and what the Federal Reserve and what our government has allowed to take place and the big government factor. Um, that's the reason why I got into studying and learning more about what anarchy truly is and about voluntarism as well. I mean, I think those are definitely important concepts and philosophies and ideologies that we should be incorporating. 
And that's why I had you do that um, piece for me on the voluntarist video that I did for Bitcoin Ben, because Ben wanted me to do a class to try to educate people as to what voluntarism is. And I feel like we're, we're at a, a shift in a lot of things in humanity. And, you know, I, I definitely have been hearing a lot of that. It's things aren't going to be the same after all this. And it's a chance for us to really right now, while we're all sitting at home, self reflect and think about things in our life and, and reevaluate what's important to us and get back to being good hum humans. And I'm really trying to encourage people as much as possible to really be the change that they want to see in this world, because with everything that's going on right now, we need it so much more than ever. Um, I don't know what to take of the virus. I don't, you know, there's so much disinformation out there. I don't really know how serious this is because you look at Italy, like Northern Italy, it looks bad. You look at what happened in China earlier, it looks bad. Now China is like opening back up. I've talked to people in Shanghai and they're going to work. Uh, I believe their movie theaters and entertainment things are so closed, but you can go to restaurants and get food. You can go to work and things like that. And, you know, I'm really concerned with not having the correct information about what's going on and what's behind all this because it seems really, 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 uh, it's, it's, it, it's, we're going, we're going through long links by pausing the world and killing economies and having people not work for a virus that we're not sure if it's just a bad version of the flu. And since I'm bringing this up, I've seen your tweet and I'm not trying to, to dog your tweet about what you said, because I have, I have mixed feelings. I kind of agree that we should, because I was asking you with where you're at, not trying to disclose your, your location, but you're, you don't have a lot of people where you're at and you've got a small number of cases. And it seems it, to me, logically, it would be easier to separate those small number of people and allow the rest of the people to be able to just, you know, exist. But we're not being told how serious this stuff is. I mean, is it that serious that we have to be staying inside and we can't be communicating? Or is there something else going on? Or is it a combination of all the above? And you've done a little bit of traveling. I know that you've traveled from Japan. I know you've been in England and now where you're at now. So, I mean, between all your travels and, and such and educating yourself at home, what do you think about all this? You know, everything that I've just talked about and mentioned. Yeah, the short answer is I don't know, and I, I don't think anybody really knows yet, and it's still kind of too early to, to tell. Uh, what I do know is I don't trust the government to say the right thing. I'm, the government lies about everything all the time and keeps things secret from everybody. I'm, the government literally thought it was fine to, you know, give, intentionally give people syphilis and then tell them that they're being treated, and then, but actually not treat them at all, just to watch and see what was going to happen. Or they literally, you can Google all this, it's all, you know, public now, they literally fed uh, mentally handicapped kids radioactive oatmeal to see what was going to happen to them. Like, they've done all sorts of just horrible, not all that long ago, we're talking about, you know, there's plenty of people still alive that had this sort of stuff going on to them uh, today. So it's really, uh, if you're going to trust the government, what they say about this stuff, I think you're, uh, I think you're naive. <laughs> I think we don't know. And, and, and nobody really knows at this point. And uh, each person's just doing the best we can. And we can look at, at experts and decide what we want to believe and what we don't want to believe. And just because you believe something doesn't make it true. And just because you don't believe something doesn't make it not true. Um, but getting the entire world, you know, and telling people, Hey, we're going to send you to jail if you don't lock yourself in your house. Like, that's not something I can get behind. Like, if you're really scared of all this, like, please lock yourself in your house. Don't come out, self-isolate. Go for it. If you're not afraid at all, then, you know, go, go and have a party and do what you want. But uh, I don't think threatening people with violence over what might be a bad flu or might be, you know, might be the start of the zombie apocalypse. Uh, I'm not okay with threatening people with violence in either scenario. And, uh, and right now, that's what I see happening all over the world. There's lots and lots of threats of violence telling people, you can't open your business, you can't go out, you can't do anything, uh, or we're going to you know, use 
violence against you. And they don't call it violence. They say, oh, it's a self-isolation, which is a nicer sounding word. But what really happens, like if you go out and do, you disobey them, ultimately they'll shoot you if you disobey them strongly enough. So uh, I'm not on board with that. It, yeah, it's all, I mean, it's almost as if we're in the early stages of like a martial law type situation. And that's the thing that, that scares me the, the most is with aside from the disinformation and not really knowing what's going on is when governments achieve this level of power, you know, giving it up is, is the thing, you know, are we have, are we just, you know, basically submitting ourselves to this 1984 brave new world paradigm, you know, are we just giving up and just becoming even more of slaves than we were before? I hate to say that I, I think we are, but I, I think we are. And if you look at 9-11, that was a much, much smaller event than what we have here. So 9-11, a couple thousand people died and the plane stopped flying for a couple of days, like three days or four days or something like that. Uh, but all the powers the government grabbed at that time, they never really gave any of them up. And now with you know, the coronavirus stuff, we have the entire world, you know, most airplanes in the world have stopped flying. You have entire countries that are on lockdown and people aren't allowed to leave their house or they'll be arrested. There's videos of you know, police beating people for having left their house. Uh, and the government's taking you know, more and more power to do everything. Like, I think this is a bigger change for the world than 9-11 was. And 9-11 was a pretty big change. So. Yeah, no, I think this is gonna change everything as we know it. Um... You know, I think things are not going to be the same as before. We're, it's going to be a lot of a lot of change in things, and I just don't want to see. I don't want to see the government end up getting this kind of power and us not having any say in the situation. I'm really trying to wake people up, um, trying to make people aware of what's happening. Do you think that all this money printing and adding money to the balance sheets and things. Do you think that they're going to be able to print their way out of this? What do you think is going to be outcome with our financial market that we have going on right now? Because it seems they'll be too able messy. To their, yeah. Maybe they'll be able to print their way out of this for the short term again. Um, but I don't see that lasting. If they continue to prevent everybody from going to work and all these businesses from operating and, and this and that, like that's the real disaster. Like, like we talked about at the beginning, just if you could, if printing money, if you printing dull pieces of paper with, you know, numbers on them made the world, you know, a richer place, then nobody would ever be poor ever. But the reality is it's all the factories and the businesses that are producing the, you know, the cameras and the food and the houses and the cars and the gasoline and all the stuff that people use. And if all those people aren't able to go to work and produce those things, the world is going to become a poor place in a hurry as all the ones that already exist start getting used up and worn out and food eaten and, and uh, that sort of thing. So it's, that's going to be the real disaster. Like what happens if all the goods stop being produced and government's still printing money? right? The money doesn't, there's no goods for the money to buy. What good did printing all the money do if there's no goods for the money to buy? And that's kind of the direction that we're headed right now with nobody being allowed to go to work around the world. And I'm, I'm really, really uh, concerned about that. So uh, yeah, I, I am concerned. laughing now when all the prep, people used to laugh at the preppers. I think the preppers were the, the smart ones uh, now. And uh, it's not too late totally to, to prep, but do a little more preparation now if you can. No, I agree. And I have actually been uh, over the past couple of years, as I can afford it, been trying to accumulate things in the prepper area, um, foods, survival gear, um, even some weapons, because, you know, if we get to a, a, a point, you know, we may have to, I may have to be in a position where I had to defend myself as a voluntarist. Um, because unfortunately, there are so many people that disrespect other people's rights and like to enforce things with violence. And I mean, that could just be anything from and this is my big concern you kind of going off what you mentioned is how much stuff is in the warehouses um versus how much stuff is in the big warehouses and how much stuff is being made to be delivered to the warehouses you know we're not i don't I really think that last step is the scary one right like how much stuff is being made right now to be delivered to the warehouses right not too much because there's mega warehouses that hold a lot of storage and then they they deliver to the little warehouses and so that, that was my big concern you know because i've gone out to walmart in the past two weeks and two weeks ago it was like almost everything was kind of gone food wise it was very slim pickings um no bread um, no, no there's a lot of stuff in the freezer section that was gone. Um, 
out of all the vitamin C's and things like that, no toilet paper. I go back a week later to another Walmart in the same city and there's food, uh, not as much as there would normally be, but there was food and I was able to pick up bread. I was able to get some meat and things like that. And a couple of different places had toilet paper, but it was very limited amounts and they were only allowing people to get like one package, which is completely understandable. But I, I really can't get a straight answer from anybody in the trucking industry and in the warehousing industry of like what's coming into those warehouses. Like, are we going to get in a position where we're going to run out of what's in the stores and we have to ration what we have. And I keep hearing all these people like I've already ran out of my quarantine snacks and you know, people are sitting here gorging themselves in like a week or two and are, you know, are we going to have more food available to us? It's like, these are the questions that are on my mind and I'm not trying to, talk about this is like fear porn. I'm trying to talk about this to have a legitimate discussion so that we can try to prepare other people for what's, you know, could potentially happen. And my philosophy is to be prepared for disappointment. That's my key to serenity. It sucks. It's sad, but it works. So another thing I'd, I'd like to add to all that is you see all sorts of people around the world, they're all bent out of shape and mad about price gouging. And this guy is selling toilet paper on eBay for $50 a roll, or a guy had a whole bunch of hand sanitizer he was selling on Amazon at a high price. And, and they literally, I went and, you know, the government went and uh, stole all that guy's hand sanitizer and basically forced him to give it to some church or something like yeah. that. Yeah, donate it. And you see all the people on Reddit and the internet sharing, yeah, go and prosecute him, he's a dirtbag. And like, no, 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 no. These people don't understand that prices are a form of communication, right? Prices have to be able to change. If someone's willing to pay a high price, they're willing to pay $100 for a bottle of hand sanitizer or a roll of toilet paper, that means they really value the hand sanitizer and the toilet paper. And that allows the market signal to go out there and say, hey, people need to produce more hand sanitizer. People need to produce more toilet paper. People need to produce more of whatever the price has gone up with. And if the, it's available in other areas, then they'll start shipping it in. And, and the, if you don't allow the prices to change or you don't allow this to happen, that blocks the signal of what people's preferences are out there. And it's a really, really big problem. Like anytime you have price controls, you're blocking the pricing mechanism from telling people what goods should be allocated to produce what other goods. And when the prices were able to go up on like face masks, for example, I got a really interesting uh, email that proved this exact point that the prices transmit the information that allow you know millions of people all over the world who've never met and know nothing about each other to cooperate to produce the things that millions of people all over the world want so there was a company that i used to buy electronic parts from that was made in china they were making these little optical transceivers for us and we would sell them all over the world this is back before bitcoin when i was doing memory dealer stuff that company emailed me three or four days ago saying due to the coronavirus stuff, we've allocated part of our resources in our factory and our labor. We're now producing face masks. Would you be interested in buying face masks from us and being a distributor for face masks? And I thought that, that was so interesting. So here's a company that normally makes computer parts. They've now transitioned to making face masks because the prices were allowed to go up and everybody saw, oh, there's a demand for, uh, for face masks we'll start making face masks. Whereas otherwise, if the prices hadn't been allowed to move at all, or if like, you know, there's a command economy where the government just distributes everything and there were no pricing, nobody would know how many face masks should be made. So this is a perfect example of the pricing mechanism transmitting the information as to what goods should be being produced by the factories to be sold to people. Or we saw the same thing with other companies that used to make uh, perfumes have started making hand sanitizer because I guess some of the equipment is similar. It can be transferred over. If the price of the hand sanitizer hadn't been allowed to go up or, or wasn't able to go up, why is the perfume company going to switch to making hand sanitizer? They're already optimized for making perfume. So it's so incredibly important to allow the prices to adjust and not complain about price gouging or price fixing or price dumping or any of that sort of stuff. Prices are the information that allow, allow the entire world's population to collaborate with everybody to produce the most amount of the things that people value and want the most. So, so don't be mad at these people that are buying up a bunch of things and then selling it for a higher price on Amazon. They're helping transmit the information to get the word out to the producers and the raw resource uh, producers and the factories of what goods need to be produced to satisfy people's demands in the market. Uh, so the, the, the people that are buying up a bunch of stuff and then selling for more, they're not, they're not price gouges or leechers or, or bad people. They're, they're economic heroes for doing that sort of thing. And it's really disappointing for seeing, uh, you know, how many people don't understand that and try to attack these people for trying to help the market act uh, more efficiently by, by doing this sort of thing.
Well, yeah, I mean, the price control thing definitely affects, you know, what you're saying is let the, op- let the market operate as a free market and it will correct itself. And that, and that makes complete sense. But, you know, what's the ironic thing about, and, and, I, and I didn't take in consideration and think about prices going up, communicating the need for more of that to be made. So I appreciate you making that point. And it, it does make sense. Um, but what I do find interesting is how the government can say, that that guy in Georgia or whatever can't have all those, all that hand sanitizer and charge more or eBay and um, saying that you can't price gouge. When I went to Walmart and bought my toilet paper, um, it, it just ended up so happening to be that the toilet paper they had was the normal toilet paper that I buy. And it normally costs like seven, seven dollars and some change with uh, tax. And it actually was ten dollars and some change. So Walmart had actually increased the price of the toilet paper. And I don't know if that started from the manufacturer in and went all the way down, but if the government's going to sit there and condemn people for, for being uh, entrepreneurs uh, and price gouging and hoarding and things like that, then it's, it's kind of ironic that they didn't do that to Walmart. Cause I think if you think about that from $7 to $10, that's a pretty big increase. It's like what, like somewhere around thirty percent, roughly, off the top of my head. No, almost fifty percent, right? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a pretty high figure. So, I mean, and there's nothing being said about that. Um, it's not quite fifty because it would be more like the fourteen dollar range. Um, but from seven dollars to ten dollars, so a three dollar increase off seven dollars. But fifty percent of seven dollars is three dollars and fifty cents, and the price went up three dollars, so it went up uh, almost almost fifty percent there. Okay, yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. That does, yeah, yeah. So, and that's completely allowed. And in fact, you're, the, Donald Trump is going to bring um, people from Walmart on to press conferences and give them all this publicity because they're supposed to be helping out with testing and things like that. But but they can raise the price of the products, and it's okay. But another another important. If I can add to that, another important thing that when the price goes up, so like let's say, you know, everybody's panicking and buying toilet paper. You go into the Walmart, you see the toilet papers, you know, if it's the normal old price of $7, maybe you'll buy two, maybe you'll buy three packs. But if the price is, is you know, $10, when it used to be $7, you think, oh, do I really want to stock up on toilet paper? Am I really scared that I'm going to run out of that? Maybe I'll just buy one pack instead of two packs. And so it allows the people that really want toilet paper to still be able to have it. And it's better to be able to buy something at a high price than to not be able to buy it at all. So like if they kept their price at $7, and they were totally sold out. You can say, oh, great, I could buy the toilet paper for $7 if they had any. Uh, that, that's horrible, right? It'd be, it'd be better to be able to buy toilet paper at $10 than to not be able to buy it at all at $7. And so that's what allowing the prices be able to do. It's better to be able to buy something at a high price than to not be able to buy it at all. And so that's why it's so important to allow the prices to adjust to reflect the, the current market conditions. Great point, dude. Yeah, I know. I know that your time is somewhat limited. So, and um, I know you're also bored. Uh, so, I do want to try to connect up with you possibly in the next week or two and continue the conversation. But I do want to talk about something cryptocurrency related, and it's in regards to what's going on with price right now and consideration to everything around the world. Because it seems like, to me, in my opinion. Uh, The Satoshi Nakamoto Bitcoin white paper, the point of it was uh, to get us away from what is currently happening in our financial system around the world. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Um, Okay. Absolutely agree with it. So with with that being said, in 2008, when we seen uh, a crash taking place, um, we seen everything from hard assets to stock markets sell everybody's selling getting into cash silver and gold went down in price once the smoke started clearing and all that then people started going to the safe haven assets and going back to your gold and silvers and we've seen an increase in price of gold and silver it doesn't seem like right now people are catching on to the idea that bitcoin is an answer away from what's happening around the world globally in our financial system and I'm curious as what your thoughts are on that. And do you see Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, cryptocurrencies in general, not, not trying to single out anything in particular, just cryptocurrencies. Do you see cryptocurrencies acting as a safe haven during this particular crisis that we're going through? They certainly could have been. 
Um, I think the real problem, and not to beat on a dead horse too much, but we, we used to have more and more merchant adoption around the world and more and more stuff happening. And when the box on Bitcoin filled up and gave the you know, bad user experience on Bitcoin, we had companies like Microsoft and Dell Computer and Steam and this and that literally stop accepting Bitcoin for payments. So we had reverse merchant adoption for the first time ever in the history of Bitcoin. So imagine in an alternative universe in which the blocks had not been allowed to fill up and not only were Microsoft and Dell and Expedia and you know uh, everybody else starting to accept Bitcoin, but all sorts of other businesses started accepting it. Businesses were using it for payroll. All sorts of great stuff had happened in the you know the, the four years since the blocks were allowed to become full. Uh, where would we be today, right? Suddenly the government starts printing money like crazy, and people are going to be mad about bailouts. They'd suddenly say, "Oh, well, I can spend Bitcoin at just about everywhere. I can spend it at the grocery store. I can spend it at the supermarket. I can spend it on you know Expedia, and Microsoft, and the car dealership, and the mortgage company, and everywhere." Why am I going to keep using these dollars? They just made six trillion more of. I'm going to just switch everything over to this, and the entire world would have that ability to do that. But today, in the in the universe that we're living in, that infrastructure wasn't put in place. The Lightning Network's not ready yet. The Bitcoin fees are still high. The network still gets congested, and the other you know competing cryptocurrencies to that don't have a big enough network effect. They don't have enough merchants. They don't have enough wallets. They don't have enough users. The, the infrastructure's not there. So like, I feel like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin specifically could have been ready. This could have been the all time, you know, moment for it to shine and really take over the world and go head to head and supplant some of these government issued currencies and as far as money being used in the world. But because of that scaling bottleneck and the, the high fees and slow unreliable transactions, driving away merchant adoption and driving away users, uh, Bitcoin's not really ready yet for even though we okay, have well, this, what would have been a perfect storm to drive adoption. There's still that makes a lot of sense. But what what about the idea of people using cryptocurrencies for a store of value? I mean that that's kind of what people are using gold and silver for. They're not using gold and silver for, with merchant adoption to go buy things. They're using it to to preserve their wealth. Do you see the potentiality of people utilizing cryptocurrency to preserve their wealth in that aspect. I know it's not the the reason that you think cryptocurrency was, was created. And I agree that there should be a peer to peer cash system. But when you look at it from this other angle, do you think the store of value factor could, could come into play as a potentiality? I only can see that coming to play to the extent to which Bitcoin is used as cash in commerce. And the reason I see that differently than, you know, gold or silver I'm sure there's some gold or silver in this iPhone, right? Like there's all, I'm sure there's some gold or silver in this, this battery, right? Like there's a gold and silver are used in all sorts of industrial use cases to do all sorts of things. I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of people in the world that are still getting, you know, gold and silver fillings in their teeth, right? Gold and silver have been used in industry for thousands and thousands of years. And that's what gave gold and silver the ability to also be used as money because it had all these secondary use cases. And if, if gold hadn't been able to use for, you know, as for fillings and teeth or, you know, electronics today or all these other, you know, use cases for gold, uh, it wouldn't have wound up being used as money either. And so I think the same thing is true with the store value aspect of uh, Bitcoin is it has to be usable as money uh, in order for it to also be usable as a store of value. Uh, and so if you destroy Bitcoin's usability in commerce for payments, you're also at the same time destroying its usability as a store of value. And so that's the, the difference that I see between the gold and silver argument versus the, the Bitcoin being a store of uh, value argument. Is it, in order to be a store of value, it has to have an additional use case. And other than Bitcoin being used for payments, I don't know what that other additional use case is that could enable it to be used as a store of value because you can't you know, make electronics out of your Bitcoin. You can't give yourself two fillings out of Bitcoin. Uh, it has to have some other use case. And I think that use case is, is the payments thing, but uh, the Bitcoin core developers have successfully damaged severely the, the usefulness of Bitcoin for payments. Okay, well, I mean, okay. So with all that being said, I mean, let's just take Bitcoin core out of the equation. Um, I mean, you, we've got Bitcoin Cash, we have Dash, we have all these other cryptocurrencies. Um, do you see the potentiality that people could run to other cryptocurrencies as a safe haven asset, um, as a store of wealth. I wish and hope, but I, I think the network effect isn't big enough yet, right? So Bitcoin has the biggest network effect. And even yeah. there, how many shops are there in your town where you can spend Bitcoin? Not many. And there's yeah, even no, less right. where you can spend your Ethereum or your Ripple or your Dash or your Bitcoin Cash. Uh, 
out there. So the network effect is so incredibly important. Whereas with your dollars, you can go not just anywhere in the U.S. and spend them. There's plenty of other countries around the world where you can spend your dollars as well. Uh, and so I, I think we have to get that adoption in commerce and we're working at it. But to have big giant companies like Microsoft or Expedia literally stop accepting Bitcoin because of the full blocks and the high fees like that, that should have been a warning sign for every single Bitcoin fan on the planet that there is something seriously, seriously wrong with businesses that went through the time and effort to start using it as money then had to stop using it as money. That was an absolute disaster and, and one that I don't know Bitcoin will, I don't know if it'll ever be able to, to recover from. And it's one that to delay the adoption of cryptocurrency around the world, not just Bitcoin, but all cryptocurrencies yeah. delayed their adoption, you know, by years and years and years, maybe, maybe a decade or more. So that's a great point. That's a great point. And you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, man. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Uh, before we do wrap things up, was there anything that I didn't talk about that you wanted to include? I guess if I can make a book recommendation to help you understand the world more clearly for everybody is read uh, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. Uh, it was a fantastic book I read as a young man, uh, and I thought it was really interesting. Uh, there's another guy named Gavin Andreessen, who's the person that Satoshi turned the project over to when Satoshi disappeared. And I was sitting in a room one time listening to Gavin give an interview back in like probably 2013 or something like that. And they asked, uh, the interviewer asked Gavin, what's a book that you want to recommend to people? And he recommended Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, the exact same book that I had read and had a big impact on me. And I thought that it was really an interesting thing that uh, this guy that uh, you know was one of the earliest people to be involved in Bitcoin ever was influenced by this exact same book that influenced me. And uh, it's a fantastic book that will help you understand the you know, pricing system and inflation and and you know all sorts of important characteristics and fallacies uh, that so many people believe uh, within the economy. So I really can, uh, can't recommend strongly enough uh, economics in one lesson. You can buy it on Amazon for you know a couple of bucks, or it's even available for free online. You can find it. Uh, I think the Foundation for Economic Education has a, a free copy, or maybe the Mises Institute does as well. So I'll, yeah, find, I'll find the links. Read in the afternoon. I'll definitely find the links and put them down below. So if people want to buy it or get a copy of it free, um, it's a book that I've heard of, I uh, kind of forgot about it. So I'm definitely going to add this to my list. So Roger, um, thanks. One more fun thing we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll pump here. So, so I just pulled this out of my wallet. This is a paper Bitcoin cash. That's a private key. The first person that scans that with any wallet that can scan a private key gets 10 British pounds, right? A worth of Bitcoin cash at the time I loaded it. I made this using gifts.bitcoin.com. You can make paper wallets or you can make images and you can send Bitcoin cash to anybody on chain via email or text message or pieces of paper like this or however you want to do it for anybody anywhere in the world. So there it is again. If anybody didn't scan it yet, the first person that scans that once this goes online gets 0.52 blah, 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 Bitcoin cash right there from that. Uh, this is another example of something that used to work on Bitcoin and no longer does with full blocks. This isn't possible uh, on Bitcoin anymore, but Bitcoin Cash or any other chain that doesn't have full blocks, uh, this works. And it's a really fun tool. So if you want to help spread Bitcoin Cash or any cryptocurrency adoption, check out gifts.bitcoin.com. And the really cool part about it, let's say I hand this to some you know, server at a restaurant or something. Um, this is the private key. If they scan it, they get the money. But at gifts.bitcoin.com, it takes a signed transaction for sending this money back to the owner that created it and it'll broadcast that transaction after 30 days so if the person you gave this to doesn't uh ever claim it the money will come back to me in 30 days so if none of your viewers oh. manage to scan this i'll get the money back but bitcoin.com never has the private keys it's going to get scanned man i'm not going to scan it but someone will scan it yeah and, let, and, uh, and, let somebody scan it and you know what here we'll, we'll do one more while we're at it so here's here's another one out of my wallet here here's another 10 10 british pounds worth so hopefully somebody can scan that Again, cool. check out gifts.bitcoin.com so you can make these. I have a bunch of them in my wallet here. So anytime I meet somebody that deserves a tip, I can hand them some, some Bitcoin cash as well. That's an awesome uh, idea. So now, to be fair, to be fair, I do, I do want to do an, and I, and, you know, we had talked about doing a follow-up interview from the first interview that I did with you. Um, and I do want to talk about some things regarding Bitcoin cash. So to be fair, if you're available in the next two weeks, I'll, I'll hit you sure. back up and we'll do an interview specifically about Bitcoin Cash. But I really wanted to get your um, thoughts and um, everything. You know, you, you have an extensive knowledge in economics. Um, you're obviously a, a big advocate for cryptocurrency. So I, I thought it would be really important to have this discussion to hopefully enlighten others. And I hope some, some people found value in this conversation. So Roger, again, I really appreciate your time and uh, I'll definitely follow up with you. I'm gonna edit this interview, uh, this discussion this afternoon. I have another interview here in about an hour, uh, but I will have this up tonight. 
So I'll link you to everything appropriately and, um, and I'll definitely be in touch. So thank you again, brother.